Um, but we're also a social enterprise. We have a commercial arm to what we do that helps pay for the charitable work that we do. Uh, we've been operating in the Wellington region for 20 years this year, uh, and we've been in this space for about 12 years. Um, in this space, we've done about 80% of this space used to be a car park, which is why you have these kind of cool lines all over the space. Um, we, we did 80% of what's in this space was retrofitted from other spaces. Uh, we put that lovely pallet wall in and there's a nice solar array outside which helps pay for our power here as well. Uh, and the, it's kind of a bit like a passive building in that the concrete floors are intentional and in that when that sun comes in, it just warms the floor up and it warms the building up. So we very rarely have to turn the heat, heaters on in here. We're not fully funded by anyone in particular. We get funding from all over the place. We get funding from government, um, both central and national government, and we do um, a lot of grants applications to different uh, philanthropic trusts, uh, and we do get the odd donation from people as well. Uh, we have around, oh, I don't know what our current um, full-time equivalent is. We have around 50 staff here. Um, this is a this is us, our, our crazy staff, um, and yeah, very varied kind of jobs that everyone does. Uh, and we have currently about 80 volunteers on our books. 30 of those work in our curtain bank, which you'll get to see a little bit later on, uh, and the rest help us out in our eco centre with our repair cafes, uh, things like that. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so this is our mission to create, I always just say, to create warm, dry, healthy homes and um, to pretty much look after Papa Tuanuki, which is Mother Earth. So that's it. We've, we've had those two kaupapa, uh, or two statements, uh, since the beginning of the trust. Um, yeah, to create warm, dry, healthy homes and to help people live more sustainably. Ding! <laughs> Climate action. Ding! <laughs> Was a bit of a short one. So we do a lot of things here. So we have our eco centre. Uh, this needs to be updated because we've actually just recently shut our eco shop. Oh yeah, it's a touch screen. I forgot about that, but I still like your involvement so you can carry on. <laughs> can you go back though? I think if you go back, yeah. Uh, so our eco centre is, um, oh I can tell you a bit about why we shut the shop. That's a good, good story. So the shop that we had here was once again about helping people create warm, dry, healthy homes, I'm just going to keep repeating this, or living more sustainably. So a lot of the products we had were to help people uh, replace plastic products or um, reduce their use of plastic products. So things like bamboo toothbrushes instead of plastic toothbrushes, solid oral care tablets instead of um, toothpaste tubes. Uh, the problem that we found in the last couple of months is that the, we had a massive downturn in sales um, and part of that is because those products are now available in supermarkets. You can go to a supermarket, you can get your, tooth, you know, your bamboo toothbrush there for a lot cheaper than we can sell it for here because they've got bigger, they're, they're buying in bulk. So we're kind of proud in a way that before, when this shop opened I think nine years ago, uh, you couldn't get those products anywhere else, so we were the only place that you could start to look at replacing those plastic products. Uh, and now it's so mainstream that actually our little shop couldn't survive. So whilst it's sad, we were really sad to say goodbye to the shop, it's like, yay, sustainability's mainstream, and we helped do that. So that's really exciting. We use the space for education sessions. We have part of the curtain bank working out here, sorting curtains, uh, and we get a lot of stuff, um, a lot of stuff donated. So. We take um, bikes for a program called Rebicycle, which uh, then give those bikes to families in need, generally refugee families, to help them get around, and they also teach biking skills. Uh, we have car seats. Car seats only have a 10-year lifespan, and then they can't be reused. Um, we take uh, curtains for our curtain bank and tracks. And then we take um, plastics, twos and fives, which can't be recycled in our normal recycling system. They have to be taken off the bottles, which is really painful. And we'll, we'll actually, you're actually going to get to do a bit of sorting in a little bit, and you'll see how painful it is. Um, metals of any kinds, which is great, because that actually kind of helps make us money and pay for this place. Uh, and we take e-waste, of which Kim is just dealing with a whole lot of right now. So heaters, toasters, jugs, hair dryers, anything that you plug in or has to use a battery to run. And we send those off to a recycler for correct, um, like, breaking down and disposal, rather than it ending up in landfill where it's going to leach a whole lot of metals that could be reused. So, 
think that's, I'm trying to think around this right. Uh, we also have a um, composting hub here uh, with another group called Kai Cycle, uh, and I will we'll show you that on the tour. Um, Kai Cycle, you have to pay to belong to it, so you bring your compost here, and then you put it in a, a container, a rubbish bin, uh, and then a, an urban farm manager comes and sorts it out. And then the compost that we make here goes to local groups to help with gardening. So city housing, where you know tenants that people that can't afford to live in Wellington currently with the rents uh, and are supported by government or local council. Uh, they often have community gardens, uh, and we also have um, we also work with the. Uh, Compassion Soup Kitchen as well, which is just down the road, who support people who need food. Um, yeah, all right, let's go next. Uh, we have a Wilder Kids program, uh, which is with five to 12 year olds, getting them out in nature. Uh, it's all about connecting them to nature, because if you're not connected to nature, then generally you don't care about it. So that's kind of the whole point of that program. Uh, and Kim over there actually runs it. Uh, it's up in our town belt, um, Mount Victoria, up just if you just carry on up the road in a tsunami, it's a great place to run. Um, it's very steep. Um, yeah, and they do all sorts of things like foraging and hut building and lighting fires and cooking marshmallows, kind of like Camp America, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. I've done Camp America, um, but for kids. We all want to kind of want to go up and do it for adults, but we haven't managed to do it yet. Cool. I'm not even looking at this anymore. Uh, we do, yeah, I talked a bit, bit about composting, so we do a lot of stuff in the urban agriculture space, so helping more communities set up sites where they can grow food. It's all about food resilience. Wellington, if there's in a major earthquake, Wellington's going to get cut off from the rest of New Zealand, uh, and so the more food we can grow locally, I hope I didn't scare anyone then, uh, <laughs> the more food we can grow locally, um, the better, so that in an, in an emergency like that, like the Hawke's Bay um, has just been cut off for weeks and weeks and weeks because of um, massive flooding. Uh, thankfully, like the other food growing centre of New Zealand, so not so much of a problem for them, but for us it would be a massive problem. So, cool, ding. Um, this is what we're doing right now, and this is you're going to come along on a street clean. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. It's a beautiful day, thankfully. Um, so the reason we do this sort of stuff is, sure, going out once a month and picking up rubbish off the streets, you know, people are like, what's, what's the point? What, what impact is that going to have? The point is that if enough people do it and enough people see us doing it, and there's another group coming, a workplace is coming in to join you today, which has like got nine people, and there's a little kindergarten coming, and you know, the more people that come to these things and the more people see other people doing this, they're like, hey, I could do that. And a lot of where we're going to go is down towards the waterfront, so we're sort of stopping those plastics and things from floating into the water. Yeah, so it's, it's like little steps that you can take towards climate action that can have a big impact in the end if we all just take little steps. All right, ding! Repair cafes, so this is what we've, we've been doing a lot more of this. Um, so in terms of the waste hierarchy again, repairing, reusing is a really important step. Uh, so we run these um, th three monthly, and people can bring in electronic devices, um, toasters, we hate toasters because about one in four have a chance of being repaired, um, vacuum cleaners, they also bring in other things, so wooden items, we actually have a really cool um, person with a 3D printer, so they can print, so someone had one of those cool old Nana TV trays uh, that are like made out of tin and it had a plastic clip at the bottom and the plastic clip had broken. Now normally you'd just have to chuck that away, but he was actually able to 3D print and attach a new one of those. And then these old people who love their TV trays got to keep their TV trays. So there's some really cool things that happen. Uh, and then when you book in for one, you, you, you book a slot uh, and you say I'm bringing in a toaster or so that if there's too many electronic goods or if we need another electronic um, volunteer, we can bring another one in. So it's quite a controlled sort of thing. Seems like you just kind of rock up, but you don't. We also do um, Just So events monthly, uh, where we uh, have people, you can bring fabric items in. So jeans that are ripped or, you know, whatever, your favorite t-shirt, your favorite jacket. And there's sewers that will sit down next to you and kind of teach as well as do. Uh, so it's about teaching people skills and with the change of our eco centre, we're actually um, going to set up a permanent repair space where people who don't have access to a sewing machine can come in and just fix their items here 
and we also have lending things we can lend so we've actually got a couple of sewing machines that we lend out to groups as well. Um, currently on the planet there is enough clothing to clothe the next six generations. So fast fashion is a massive problem uh, and this is just once again one small way we can kind of help with that and if you look at the sort of six things you can do in terms of climate, the, the most important things you can do as an individual in terms of climate action, um, only buying three items of new clothing a year is one of those things. Last year I bought none um, and it wasn't hard at all. I mean charity shopping, sites like you know Facebook Marketplace, all those sorts of things just make it so much easier not to buy new clothing. So not trying to make anyone feel guilty if you're a shopaholic, but you know it is one of those things that um, is a really easy action to take. Cool. Okay, we've, I've actually kind of talked about that stuff a little bit, but we do, I did miss a few things, I knew I would. So we do silicon, uh, silicone um, recycling as well. Um, I'll show you what that is in a minute. I'm sure you probably know. I think I got everything else. Oh, and wool. So we work with something called, is it on there? Oh yeah, Threads of Aroha, which is Threads of Love. Um, and they have 350 volunteers around Wellington who are like crafty volunteers and they make blankets for the neonatal unit at the hospital and for pets in need. They make like little jerseys and things. Wow. It's so cute. That's what we should have a picture of out there, the, the dog and the jumper. Cool, next. Um, we do a lot of advocacy here at the Trust. So we, have, we belong to these networks. So uh, these are national networks. I'm on the board of Environment Hubs Aotearoa, which are hubs like us all across New Zealand. There's now 23 of us that belong to that. Community Energy Network that, that focuses on fair energy and people suffering from energy poverty where they can't afford to heat their house to the World Health Organization standard of 18 degrees Celsius, which is really not that warm. Um, and the Zero Waste Network, which is the largest network, which is all the kind of resource recovery hubs around New Zealand, anyone working in Zero Waste. And we have three staff who are all on each of those boards and another staff member on the New Zealand Association for Environmental Educators. Um, so those groups, plus ourselves at Sustainability Trust, uh, are constantly advocating both local and national government for changes that are going to promote climate action. So uh, we've just commented on, Wellington City Council has actually just released a uh, strategy for zero waste um, in Wellington and we had a lot to do with um, making that happen and getting it right. So yeah, it's probably one of the best strategies we've ever seen because there was actually a lot of community engagement with it. So we're really proud of that work. Um, unfortunately it's work that doesn't get funded. So yeah, but it's really important. So we do it. Fair energy, I've just talked about that, I skip. But we have, um, we have just launched our own electricity company last year. Uh, so once again, it's all about helping those people in energy poverty. It's, it's no small feat to launch an electricity company. Um, I'm not gonna get into it because I'm not the fair energy manager, um, but we have someone here who studied as an electrical engineer and then went and studied electricity overseas. And uh, yeah, so he started a electricity company so for every three regular customers we can help someone suffering from energy poverty and help them pay their bills over winter. Our curtain bank, I'm not going to talk about it because we're going to go see it. Flick. Um, healthy homes, so uh, this is one of, another one of my teams. Uh, I look after all the charitable stuff here, so all the charitable, pretty much everything we've already talked about except for the energy stuff. Um, we go into people's homes who uh, have small children who are suffering from respiratory illnesses, anyone under the age of five, um, or pregnant, pregnant mums uh, living in um, what's called low decile areas, uh, hot, sorry, high decile areas. Um, so, yeah, communities um, with bad housing, bad social outcomes, bad education outcomes, all those sorts of things. Yeah, so we have a team of six that go out and help vulnerable families with things like curtains, um, we can do new bedding, lots of these people are sleeping in one room because they haven't got heaters or they can't afford heating, um, they often sleep in share beds, some of their beds are mouldy, the, the crew go in and like, there's just black mould all over the roof, it's in the bedding, these children are sleeping in these beds, that's why they're constantly in hospital. Um, 
and they've just recently, University of Otago has just done a study um, for pretty much every $1 million that the government puts into this program, it is a government uh, funded program, they get $3 million out of it in terms of saved costs from kids going to hospital, parents going to hospital, kids skipping school, parents missing work days, all those sorts of things. So uh, it's, a, it's an amazing program and it's actually just been rolled out rolled out nationwide. Um, thankfully we were one of the first areas to be part of the kind of pilot scheme so we've been doing it for many years and we're really proud of it. Ding! Yep, talked about that. That's why I don't know why I bother printing this off. Sustainable homes. So this is the commercial arm. We put heat pumps, insulation, ventilation and lighting into people's houses and we charge them for it. Ding! <laughs> um, yeah, so I've already talked about that. Ding! Um, yeah, so we, uh, we're trying to try and walk the talk here. So we've now got only EV or hybrid cars. Uh, we still have um, petrol vans. Uh, we did have one EV van, uh, but we actually ended up selling it to another charity because it was just too big for our needs. Um, and EV vans are still very, very expensive. So we haven't quite made it there yet, but we're really proud that our entire fleet, which is I think something like 18 cars are now all hybrids or EVs. Ding. Couldn't do it without friends and partners. Can everyone read? No. <laughs> um, but that just shows you like it takes a lot to kind of get things right uh, and working with our partners is really important to us. That includes mana whenua and um, Māori organisations who we work really closely with. You know, a lot of these things that we are doing is so important to get right for our Māori and Pacific communities. So yeah, and we are very much a Tauri Pākehā organisation so it's really important that we work with partners. Right. Questions? Yeah, questions. There's a that was my spiel. Yes? This is just so wonderful. I think there should be these just everywhere. Um, how, I mean, it's the funding piece of it. I'm curious about hearing more about that. Like, does it go up and down? Do you have to grow and shrink and, it, you know, that piece of it? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, we definitely, we're in a, a, a bit of a degrowth phase um, and that's because we have, yeah, government funding in particular comes and goes. They love, they love funding new things, which is just like, yeah, um, we can't just keep coming up with new stuff. You just need to fund the stuff that works. Um, and yeah, so we have actually, we were at 76 staff and we've dropped to about 50 recently. So we've had to get rid of some of the, um, commercial arms and like that's the decision to shut the shop yeah so you're just constantly trying to work out you know how we're gonna f how we're gonna fund this place this year and sometimes that's a real struggle and I'm, I'm glad I'm not the CEO of this organization because uh, we do have like a seven last year was a 7.1 million dollar turnover so it's not a small organization like it's you know it's not massive compared to um, you know commercial organizations but we're not a little player in the game. Um, most of the other environment hubs around New Zealand are kind of anywhere between 500,000 and 1.1 million. So we're, we're definitely one of the bigger ones. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a constant struggle and we're just constantly applying for funding grants. And yeah, that's a big part of my role. So yeah. Yes. So is there a, a, like a designated staff person that writes grants? Grant not here. Not here. Most um, hubs, yes. Not here because I can't write a funding application to get money for Toast Electric because I know nothing about energy. Well, I know a little bit, obviously, but not enough to get a grant for that. Likewise, I can't write a, a funding application for a, starting up a zero waste hub. Our sustainability manager would take care of that. So we've consciously made a decision that every kind of senior leader does their own grants. But we talk about what we're going to go for because there are obviously some grants that are like, you could do this or this. And we're like, well, we need some money over here. So we'll go for repair cafes with that grant. And we'll go for Toast Electric over on that side. Yeah. Cool. And yes, cool. What, how would you say is like your biggest method for pulling in new people, like new customers or clients to like use the services here? Yeah, so that's on the commercial side, uh, it's very different to the, char the charitable side. So the commercial side is advertising, marketing, kind of normal generic ways of doing things. So Facebook adverts and 
advertising on TV on demand. Um, for the other side, uh, a lot more of that is word of mouth. We have a lot of connections to community groups. Um, so we use a lot more unpaid media like Facebook. We have a newsletter following of 17,000 people. Um, so yeah, news gets out that way. Uh, in terms of volunteers, we um, there's a couple of ways we get new volunteers. We've, we're partners with Volunteer Wellington and Student Job Search. And um, trying to think of the other one. Can't think of the other one. Anyway, yeah, so we use different platforms to reach different people.